When a world is full of endless strife, suffering, frustration, pain, led by desires left unsatisfied, what must we do? This is one of the many subjects explored by the works of Arthur Schopenhauer. With this question, he once provided one singular answer, the will. A mindless, aimless, non-rational, insatiable force that blindly drives us towards a certain desire, propelling us to strive, to desire, and to ultimately suffer. Concept of the will has been studied, acknowledged, misinterpreted more times than we can count. But ultimately, it's not the human-like conscious motivation most interpreted as. Rather, it is an unconscious, visionless, impetuous force that inflicts the need to keep itself pursuing something with no goal other than the sake of simply keeping itself pursuing something. The will is both frightening and amusing, dangerous and relentless, but most of all, it's insatiable. For those feeling like they're drowned by the misery, tribulation, or harness of the world, the will can provide, if not a strict escape plan, a deeper understanding of the root cause of human misery, a route for suppressing the suffering of life with a conquest of vanquishing the desires in your life. To truly reach happiness in a world filled with wretchedness followed by unquenchable desires. But this is just a surface representation of the will. So let's uncover this concept in a more meaningful and less shallow way. Born in 1788 in what is now referred to as Gdańsk, Poland, his family was composed of Dutch heritage. His father, a successful international merchant, would hope for his son to become a cosmopolitan merchant like himself. And hence, the family would travel extensively throughout Schopenhauer's youth, though only to find no interest in business, but rather academics, where later on a Europe trip accompanied by his parents, Schopenhauer would witness the profound suffering of the poor consequently beginning to intellectually examine how or why the world worked, or, more accurately, why it functioned so negatively. Arthur Schopenhauer, so labeled as the pessimist philosopher, was a 19th century German philosopher, during his time quickly becoming one of the first to question the value of existence, combining Eastern, Western, and religious modes of thinking, he developed the concept of the will. But, to find its oldest influences, we must look towards late Vedic Sanskrit texts like Upanishads, which discussed Brahm, a universal supreme existence underlying reality that connects to all beings, mirrored through Schopenhauer's idea of the will as the fundamental force behind everything. Though, to find its most true influential origin, we must link the 1781 work of German thinker Immanuel Kant, whose critique of pure reason discussed the thing in itself. In the text, he spoke on the distinguishment between phenomena, the world as we experience it, that of which man's capulative reason can only know, along with noumena, the world as it is in itself, independent of our perceptions, of which man can never penetrate. Understanding thing in itself extensively would be its own pursuit, but for the purpose of this video, we will turn to Kant's words in prolegomena. And we indeed, rightly considering objects of sense as mere appearances, confess thereby that they are based upon a thing in itself, though we know not this thing as it is in itself, but only know its appearances, the way in which our senses are affected by this unknown something. Schopenhauer could be called a Kantian in many regards, but not always did he agree with the details of Kant's arguments. Schopenhauer posited Kant's reference of thing in itself as a mind-independent object is misconstructed, Maintaining instead that if we are to refer to the thing in itself, then we must come to an awareness of it. Not by invoking the relationship of casualty, where the cause and effect are logically understood to be distinct objects, but through other means. In Schopenhauer's so-called magnum opus, titled The World as Well and Representation, he introduced the two interconnected aspects of the world, the will, as we have discussed, and representation, which Schopenhauer believes is one with and in the same reality as will regarded of different perspectives. Thus, representation is an objectification of the will, and the will is the innermost nature, the underlying force of every representation, and also of the world as a whole. This is opposed to the idea that the thing in itself causes our sensations, as if we were referring to one domino striking another, but instead, it is more like that between two sides of a coin, neither of which causes the other, and both of which are the same coin and coinage. While we can recall early influences for Schopenhauer's works, we must reward him with credit. Schopenhauer's construction of the will certainly was a creation of his, built upon the ideas of others, but ultimately, his perception of it was the one that sticked and later influenced other philosophers. 
To truly understand the depth behind Schopenhauer's philosophy and suffering of the world, we must grasp exactly what he meant by the will and representation, and how exactly each of them operate. Within the world as will and representation, Schopenhauer expresses that the will is the root cause of all suffering. Because it is insatiable, senseless, and preposterous, the will leads to perpetual striving in dissatisfaction, with every desire being filled, immediately being replaced by another, consequently resulting in a constant state of yearning, eager, and frustration. For Schopenhauer, this was the essence of human suffering, as it was the essence of the universe and the imperative to exist. Likewise, in his time, there were a few sensibilities that Schopenhauer rejected, with many built upon as well. Developing his interpretation of Kant, Schopenhauer concluded that the world as we know and experience it is nothing but a mere representation created by our mind through our senses and forms of cognition, meaning we are incapable of accessing the true nature or reality of external objects outside our mental phenomenological image of them. Going a step further, he argued that we cannot know, comprehend, access, or understand all objects beyond our conscious experience, with not a single exception, but one. A singular object with not only a mental representation of itself, but a first-hand, subjective, primary experience from within it, this being the human body. With these understandings, the two faces of the world were defined, the will and representation. Within Schopenhauer's lens of the world, it becomes inherently meaningless, with no god to be comprehended. When anthropomorphically considered, the world is in a condition of eternal frustration, as it continually strives for nothing in particular, and in a grand picture, goes nowhere. Schopenhauer argued there was no escape to this, because we aren't conscious of this world to live and our existence is pointless, life is due to consist of suffering. So, unless suffering is the direct and immediate object of life, our existence must entirely fall of its aim. His philosophy posits that the only way to mitigate the suffering wasn't through suicide since that would bring nothing but a termination of the form that one's suffering takes. The proper way was through the denial and restriction of the will, whether that would be through asceticism, the practice of self-denial, or renunciation of worldly pleasures done by turning away from or renouncing one's own desiring. Thus, the goal of human life is to turn away from desire, not pursue it, realizing that salvation can only be found in resignation. Now, is this too dark? Maybe. But Schopenhauer put it perfectly himself. I shall be told that my philosophy is comfortless because I speak the truth, and people prefer to be assured that everything the Lord has made is good. Go to the priest then, and leave the philosophers in peace. Do not ask us to accommodate our doctrines to the lessons you have been taught. For those tired of suffering with need of finding meaning or purpose in life, Schopenhauer delivers reason that of which is strictly available for those intrigued by even the most dark aspects of human existence. So then, too, with this hardening formidable truth, where life is inevitably consistent of suffering, comes an answer. As a sort of escape from suffering, Schopenhauer put forth two primary methods. One, being a more radical approach, he encouraged asceticism, the most extreme pathway to the alleviation of suffering denying all pleasure similar to those lives of monks or priests, where sex, food, and alcohol are to be restricted. This would be the one path where desire could be permanently eliminated, parallelly liberating ourselves from the will to live. The true question, however, is how strong are you? And not just physically, to bring about this lifestyle of asceticism, a great mind, body, and soul are equally demanded. For this, wealth wasn't a necessary asset nor was anything really. The less you have, the easier it is to follow. You can go as far as arguing individuals in poverty are closer to such life than we have or ever will be. However, Schopenhauer recognized how the sheer difficulty and discipline demanded in this path was beyond the majority of people's capabilities. Thus, for the average individual, he suggested letting loose of ideals of happiness and pleasure, rather focusing on the minimization of pain. After all, Happiness in life, for Schopenhauer, wasn't a matter of joys and pleasures, but the reduction of freedom from pain. As he said, the safest way of not being very miserable is not to expect to be very happy. By no means was Schopenhauer an ascetic, but stumbling upon the question of how to escape the suffering of life through other means, not just being an ascetic, he articulated a more accessible method, 
that being the indulgence in art, philosophy, and perhaps modern day music. Moments we momentarily transcend the will and find peace in the sublime, with comfort and relief at our existence. Immersing ourselves in the beauty of art and depth of the artistic experience, we enter a state of pure contemplation, no longer being driven by our desires and sufferings, but uplifted into a higher plane of existence, allowing us to forget our problems and become one with the art. This is where we can be freed from the suffering of life, though it is important to mention this is to be considered as a sort of high, not a permanent escape. Because still, while his ideas are fiercely pessimistic and immensely stimulating, there is one key that allows us to unlock them entirely. To really understand Schopenhauer's philosophy of the will and eternal suffering, we must examine the context in which it was written. That context is the life he endured. Attending University of Göttingen, where shortly after enrolling in the study of medicine, Schopenhauer would dedicate himself to exploring academic philosophy, he would state, Life is an unpleasant business. I have resolved to spend mine reflecting on it. And that's what he did. Finding disillusionment with academic philosophy, which he found to be obscure and disconnected from real life concerns, he abandoned formal studies beginning his period of self-directed study, where he would spend countless hours philosophizing and writing on his own, developing his concepts, arguments, and theories. In the duration of his personal studying or self-reflection, Schopenhauer produced two seminal works. His first, On the Fourfold Root of the Principle of Sufficient Reason, published in 1813, addressing metaphysics, ethics, aesthetics, reasoning, and epistemology, followed by The World as Will and Representation in 1919. Yet, despite the profound insights delivered in these works, they received little praise, attention, or recognition throughout his 30s, 40s, and even early 50s. Schopenhauer's life was marked by personal and professional hardships. He never married, had no children, and faced significant challenges in his career. By no means was his life easy, but perhaps this is what led to Schopenhauer's philosophy, to his idea of life ingrained with suffering. The death or suicide of his father, the pain of not being acknowledged, and the constant career-altering decisions. Ultimately, Schopenhauer's story is another familiar, yet tragic one where a highly important writer, thinker, and philosopher gains barely, if any, recognition in their life, just to die in obscurity, rising to fame only a few decades later. Today, Schopenhauer is acknowledged, sometimes encouraged or even hated, but most importantly, he is respected and recognized, because despite the world's skepticism seemingly suggesting his philosophy is incorrect or invalid, not once did he cease confidently working upon his ideas of the world. Simply, Schopenhauer was unafraid to tell the truth, even if to some that was discomforting, concerning, and dark, because to others, ironically, his truths provided honesty, relief, and authenticity. At last, concepts of the will, representation, and eternal suffering were not designed to provide comfort, but to convey truth and reality of existence. As one of the first to rigorously question the value and meaning of life, Schopenhauer addressed the real concerns that resonate in each of our lives, later influencing the course of many other poets, playwrights, essayists, novelists, historians, philosophers, composers, and more. The fact is, this essay merely scratches the surface of his contributions or philosophy. So, if interested, I suggest you dwell deeper yourself.